In this video, we take a look at Computer Science AS Level 9618, Topic 6.2, Data Integrity Validation and Verification, continuing where we left off. So let's take a look at the learning targets. So candidates should be able to describe how data validation and data verification help protect the integrity of data. We'll be distinguishing between the two types. Describe and use methods of data validation, including range check, format check, length check, presence check, existence check, limit check, Check, check digit. We'll be going over all those today, as well as describing and using methods of data verification during data entry and data transfer. Uh, this is during data entry, including a visual check, double entry. We'll be talking about what those are. During data transfer, including parity check, both byte and block checks, which we'll be going over and check some. So let's dive right in. So validate, validation and verification. You need to understand the difference between these two. Validation is a check that the data entered is of the correct type and format. It doesn't guarantee that the data is accurate. It's just part of, it's in the right format that it's supposed to be. Now verification is a confirmation of data received by a system. So that is the difference between uh, those two. Now, validation, data integrity can never be guaranteed. You can improve the chances if appropriate measures are taken when data enters a system or when it is transmitted from one system to another. Validation can be a misleading term, though. Many think data is accurate if it's validated, but that's not true. If a system is expecting a name as input and the wrong name is entered, it will not bounce back an error. It's going to accept it. Validation can only prevent the wrong data type from being entered. So here are some validation check examples. You need to be familiar with all of these. Um, the Probably the most difficult part is not understanding what they are, but is remembering uh, the names because there's quite a few. So the first one is a presence check, and that's to ensure that an entry field isn't left uh, blank. We have a format check. Date has to be entered as day, day, month, month, year, year. Now remember, if, uh, if you're in a country like here we are in the States, if you're not using that date format, you must be familiar with that date uh, format because when Cambridge gives the exam, that is the date format they're going to be using is the day followed by the month followed by the year. A length check, making sure for example, like a phone number is 10 digits or a credit card is 16 digits, making sure it's the appropriate length. A range check, the month and the date must not exceed 12. It could be, you know, a certain GPA. Uh, for example, in college uh, here in the States, the highest GPA you can get in college is a 4.0. That would be an example of a range check and making sure it's in the appropriate range, not below zero and not above 4.0. Then we have a type check, only a numerical value uh, for the month, for example, that is making sure it's of the correct data type, not a string, but a, you know, a number. An existence check, checks the data in a file to make sure data actually exists, also checks for the file name. And the last one is a limit check, checks only one of the limits, either the lower or the upper limit, it does not check both. All right, so let's keep going. So making sure verification actually works. And there are three ways to make sure verification can work with no errors. The first one is double entry. Data will be entered twice by two different people. They then compare the results either after data entry or during data entry. If two different people are entering the same data, it should match up, really prevents the uh, likelihood of an error. Then we have visual check. Inner data on screen is compared with the original paper document, and then check digits. An additional digit is added to a number to make sure a set of digits are correct. Now, this is used in barcodes, ISBN, it's used in credit cards, and we'll see this more in depth uh, shortly and in class. Now, verification. This means confirming what has been entered. The most common example is when a user is asked to supply a new password. There will always be a request for the password to be re-entered, and that is to make sure because you can easily mistype a password. Maybe you have an exclamation mark at the end and you were holding shift but not holding it you know, hard enough and then you click the exclamation mark but one gets entered. By having you re-enter the password that really uh, limits the likelihood of that 
happening. Now, if a user entered a password but didn't enter as intended, subsequent attempts to access the system would fail, which we just talked about. Verification is usually an effective process, but it does not ensure data accuracy. And this is because the wrong data could be entered initially and in the re-entry. Now, uh, if you're in my class, you need to know how to get the length of a string. For example, this would be um, a uh, length check, making sure a password is a certain length. A lot of websites do that too, and we'll be doing that in class. So using dot length. Uh, so if we had a, a string called password, to get the length of the string, we would do password dot length. Make sure you make a note of that if you're in my class, because we'll be doing a programming assignment on validation and verification. All right, let's talk about it during data transfer. Now, data can become corrupted when being transmitted. It's just going to happen sometimes. Now, this usually happens at the bit level with an individual bit changing from one to zero or zero to one, because those are the only two binary numbers. Verification techniques need to check on some property associated with the bit pattern. Now, the simplest way to do this is a single bit parity check. This is really easy if the data is transferred in bytes using a seven bit code. The eighth bit is where a parity bit can be used and it uses even or odd parity. I have a practice problem that we can look at here to make this a little easier to understand. Now, if no errors are found, the transmission is accepted. Now, it cannot be guaranteed to be error free and we'll look at a, uh, at a uh, We'll look at why momentarily. Now, the limitation of even or odd parity is to determine if there is an error, but not where the error is located. And that's where checksum comes into play. By using checksum, because each bit has a different value, you can calculate it and see if it matches the same value that was transmitted. So the bits in each byte of a transmission is calculated using binary representation. The value of the binary representation is calculated for each row. So going all the way back to begin the year when we were learning how to calculate binary. Now, when the receiver receives the data, the checksum method is done again, and if it matches, it works. To find the error with a bit, though, a more complex method must be used, and this is what we call parity block check, which we are about to do. Now, we're gonna quickly review about uh, parity, because uh, it can be even or odd, even parity. You count the number of ones, they should come out to an even number, an even number of ones. Odd parity, you count up the number of ones, it should come out to an odd number. So let's take a look at this past uh, exam question. It said the word computing is to be transmitted as nine bytes of data. Each character in the word has an ASCII code value. The system uses even parity, and the leftmost bit is added to make each byte even parity. So that is important and that's what we need to know. We need to know that it's even parity. We'll take a look at another practice problem where it doesn't tell you if it's even or odd. How do you figure that out? We'll be going over that as well too. Complete the code so they all have even parity. So I'm counting up the number of ones and I see one, two, three. Well, here's where my parity bit is going for the C and because it uses even parity, I need to add a one. Count the next row for the O's, one, two, three, four, five. I need to make it even parity, so I'm gonna add a one. Now I have six ones there. Looking at the M, one, two, three, four. I already have an even amount of ones, so I'm not gonna add a one, I'm gonna add a zero. Looking at the P, one, two. Adding a zero to keep the amount of ones even. Here, one, two, three, four, four for you. I don't need to add a one, that would make it odd, and we are using even parity. So I'm gonna add a zero there. Here we have one, two, three for the T. I need to make it even. Well, three plus one is four, which will give me an even amount of ones. I'm looking at the I, one, two, three. I need to add a one to make it even. And then looking at the N, one, two, three, four. I already have an even amount, so I'm gonna add a zero. And then one, two, three, four. I'm gonna add a zero for the G, keeping it even. Now it says complete the code so they all have even parity. You'll notice that is worth two marks and it's very easy to get those two marks as long as you don't miscount the number of ones. Now if you look at this last one, it says fill in the parity byte in the final row in the table above. Well, how do we do that if we don't have any numbers here? Well, instead of going horizontal, you count vertical. So we'll start in this first column. One, two, three, four. I'm gonna add a zero, 
because I have an even amount of ones. Looking at the next column, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm going to add a one, so I have an even amount of ones. Here, all zeros. I'm going to add a zero, because if I add a one, now I'm using odd parity, not even. One, two, three, got to add a one. One, two, three, four, five, I need to add a one. One, two, three, four, five, I need to add a one. One, two, three, four, got to add a zero because that is even in the last column. One, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going to add another zero, keeping it even parity. So that is how you do that. All right, let's jump back and take a look at some of those checks that we talked about. Let's take a look at this flow chart. It says, two different validation checks are described using each of the following flow charts. Name the types of validation checks. So this is one, the first flow chart they showed. The second uh, chart is on the next slide that we're going to do. So it says start input employee ID, and input is a pseudocode term. So we need to get the employee's ID number. Now we're checking, is it more than five digits? If it is, we're going to reject it. Is it less than five digits? If it is, we're going to reject it. We're going to make sure that it's definitely not more than five digits and not less than five digits. It has to be five digits in order for it to be accepted. So the type of check this is, is what we call a length check, making sure it's exactly five digits digits. It can't be more than five. It can't be less than five. If it is, it's rejected. So we know right away it must be a length check because it must be exactly five digits. When If it's five digits, is it more than five? Nope. Is it less than five? Nope. It's exactly five. It is accepted and then it stops. All right, moving on to the next one. This is the other flow chart that we're talking about. We have a user input the salary. Making sure, is it less than zero? We're going to reject it. Okay, let's say 50,000. Is it 50,000 less than zero? Nope. Is it greater than 200,000? Nope. We're going to accept it. Now, this one can be a little tricky, and Cambridge likes to do this to make sure you really understand what is going on. Because you might be saying, ah, this is a limit check. No, it's not. It is a range check. Here's why it's not a limit check and why it is a range check. If it's a limit check, you will only be checking the lower limit or you will only be checking the upper limit. In this one, we're testing both the lower limit and we're also testing the upper limit. So it must be in the range between zero and 200,000. As long as it is in the range between zero and 200,000, then it will be accepted. So it is a range check, not a limit check. And Cambridge likes to uh, do that. So really make sure you know your stuff. So let's take a look at this one. So this one I really like, and this is one that I give my students because it's a it can be a little more uh, difficult. And uh, you know, the more prepared you are, the more likely you're going to be to succeed on anything, not just the Cambridge exam, but any exam. So let's take a look at this. The vending machine transmit eight codes, so bytes, followed by a parity byte. The following bytes have been received by the computer. Well, we know that word parity, but hasn't told us if it's even or odd. Oh, there's more to read. Great. One of, oh, one of the eight bytes of data contains an error that occurred during data transmission. Using an arrow, identify the byte where the error has occurred. Circle the bit that has been altered. Explain your reason for choosing the byte and bit identified above. Well, how in the world are we supposed to do this if it doesn't tell us if it's even or odd? We'll just figure it out ourselves, and it's very easy to do. So let's start by counting uh, with the first row, second row, and we'll find out what's going on. So in the first row, we have one, two, three, four ones. Now, just by doing the first row, I don't know if it's even or odd, because that could be the byte that has an error. I don't know. Let me check another row. Second row, one, two, three, four. I know right now, just by doing the second row, it's using even parity, because it says one has one of the eight bytes contains an error. Well, if both of these are even, I know it must be using even parity. So I'll check the third row, one, two, three, four. 
That one looks good. One, two, three, four. That looks good. One, two. That one looks good. One, two, three, four. That one looks good. Now you may be saying I'm getting pretty nervous because we're running out of rows. One, two, three, four, five. And there it is. This row has an error because the rest of them have even parity. Check in the last row. One, two. Check in the parity by one, two, three, four. So I know it is in this row right here. There's an error. But it says Using an error, identify the byte we just did. Circle the bit that has been altered. Well, how in the world do I know which bit has been altered? Well, now I got to start checking the columns. One, two, three, four. That works out. One, two. That works out. One, two, three, four. That one works out. One, two, three, four. That one works out as well. One, two, three, four. Five. Boom. That. It's in this column. That is where the error is. But how does that help me identify the bit? Well, by checking horizontal and vertical, you can find out where they intersect. So here is the row. Here is the column. I have figured out where they intersect. And they intersect right here. I know that bit that is a one is the error. That is where the error happens. I know that for a fact because I, and it says, explain your reason for choosing the byte and bit identified. We did a row check or horizontal check. We did a vertical or a column check. We, the block is using even parity. We identified the row because it has odd number of ones. We identified the column because it has an odd number of ones. We found where they intersect and where they intersect gives us the bit that has an error. Hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions, please uh, post them below. And if you did find this video helpful, please give it a like and help the channel grow. We'll see you guys in the next video.